afternoon. Um, so the topic we're going to be talking about is affecting change through arts education and reimagining learning environments. Today's panel will touch upon how educational thought leaders and practitioners in the city of Mumbai are implementing change. We will discuss how we can reimagine learning environments through integration and implementation of creative education. Bombay has historically been, apart from being the financial, commercial, and entertainment capital of India, has also been a major center for education. And since the early days, indigenous and then Western educational systems were in place as early as 1813. From the first missionary schools that took root in the city, founded by the British and Anglo-Scottish Church Association, the American missions, the church missions, um, to other pioneering women's education uh, organizations, and systems like the Zenas and the religious oriented uh, education programs to the now very popular IB programs that have been popularized in the contemporary schools. The education sector in this city has been ever burgeoning and ever changing. Um, you know, I had actually prepared uh, many opening remarks, actually my team had prepared it for me, but I think, you know, with a, with a room full of experts like you all, it's kind of redundant. So I'm going to uh, just share a couple of thoughts of mine that I experienced this month uh, to do with this topic. Um, I just was in New York last, yesterday, and I, um, I did a children's workshop there around an artist called Madhvi Parekh, and those who know her work, she's, she's a wonderful artist, very folk, and, you know, she's written a lovely book, just like the kind of art first produces called Madhvi's Magical Dreams. And we gave these books to all these 30 kids. Now, you know how art transcends geography because, you know, we thought these ABCD, which is the American born confused, you know, uh, kids would be, would, would express their, their work differently. And they were just taken through the book. It was just a very fun workshop. And each of them were inspired. Uh, this was in an art gallery setting. They went and they picked a painting that they liked and they started creating their version of it. And it was so in I mean it was so you know wonderful to see this happening and you know some of the work that was being produced I thought Madhvi thought theirs was better than hers uh, but th that said you know I think the kids of today are also kind of mu so much luckier than we were I mean I used to paint as a child and the only person who told me my work was good was the houseboy I, I'm not joking, that's true. But I have a, and uh, as Ritu knows, I have a, a, a young kid and uh, I'm quite obsessed with her, her, uh, her education and especially the arts education. Once I just, every day she creates something, says, Papa, take this is my art, take it to your office. If it's three-dimensional, it's my installation. And the other day I, I noticed one of her pieces of work and I looked at it and I, you know, for any of you all, I mean, my, sure many of you all know it, but, you know, Akbar Padamsi's Metascape. And I'm just looking at it, I said, wow, this is, and it was, you know, just rainbow colors, just mishmashed on a canvas in her room in a corner. And I asked her, I said, where did this come from? She said, Papa, I was creating a rainbow. I said, how do you do it? I use my fingers. So I thought, okay, let me just show her. So I took out this book of Akbar Padamsi, it's from my loft, I don't own any at the, at the moment. But, uh, and I opened it and showed her the book. And she says, Papa, he paints like me. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I'm not kidding, this is really happening to me. So, um... Uh, so, you know, I think the whole environment of the arts and education is so relevant today. And, you know, we've always talked about, um, you know, uh, the teachers, I mean, there a lot of models were talked about. But I experienced something a little different, again, in this month, where I was asked to go to my daughter's school and take part in a three-hour workshop on block building. Now, calling you three hours on a Saturday block building, I do enough workshops on my own. Obviously, we were all not too happy that we had to do it and was mandatory. But the, the um, and we were broken up into groups and we saw how the kids play and they build these blocks and so we built a park and I needlessly put an installation in that park. But the idea of how the kids are taught through those blocks, math, team building, angles, I mean, it was such an eye-opening exercise, and for me, you know, we, when we left, um, you know, the, 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 the principal of the school told us that you will be thinking about this project for many months to come. And it's so true. It was not just that, you know, that three-hour workshop that we binged about going to. It was what it did for you, and I think that the same, you know, we got to experience what the kids are going to experience through these different models of education. I don't think I paid the blocks. I had Lego when I was growing up, but that was pushing it. Um, and um, so I'll come back to the topic. We have uh, four wonderful speakers. Ritu is not going to present, but she will be part of the Q&A. Um, and um, 
you know, each of uh, the organizations like Art First, Gateway, uh, Gateway School of Mumbai, and the Students Biennale are, uh, you know, alternate spaces and platforms of learning and opening up options to students, um, the art teachers, parents, and future educators. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to in invite each of our panelists to, um, to share uh, their work. But before that, I, there's one very interesting case study that my team actually found. Uh, it's the Integrated Arts Academy at the H.O. Wheeler in in, in Burlington, Vermont, where uh, there's a very successful uh, integration of arts into the curriculum, and where the arts teacher and the pra uh, and the uh, teachers kind of work together to uh, hand in hand. And similar to this, you know, uh, the fourth grade geometry lesson is taught uh, through the works of the Russian artist Kandinsky, whereas the students are asked to create. Uh, their work using angles, and so they actually identify in their paintings the angles and, and, and learn, you know, uh, ge geometry. And uh, just a stat which came out of that is before I became uh, an integrated school, 17% of the third graders were proficient in the Vermont standardized test. But five years later, that number grew to 66%. So there is, you know, there's these proven uh, models which are very exciting and and uh, encouraging so without further ado what we're going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists and they, they'll come in the order of uh, we're going to request uh, uh, Aban to come up first and then I'm going to ask Shruti and then uh, Abhishek to come and do your presentations following which Ritu will join us and we'll have a round of questions thank you very much good afternoon dear friends it gives me great pleasure to be part of this very prestigious symposium that we are having today. And I'd like to speak about world of education. It also gives me great pleasure that it's the centenary of world of education this year. A hundred years ago, in answer to the request of a man called Emil Malt, who wanted a school for the children of his factory workers, Rudolf Steiner gave the impulse of Waldorf education for the Waldorf Astoria cigarette factory. And that is why it's called Waldorf, but also Rudolf Steiner education from the person who actually began this impulse. Now, first of all, it's important to know that Waldorf education is actually a part of a movement called anthroposophy. Anthroposophy means the wisdom of the human being or the understanding of the human being on earth. And in, I think this is fine, thank you. In anthroposophy, we have different subjects like education, agriculture, medicine, and so on. So they are all subjects which have to do with the human being on earth. Now, a hundred years ago, when the First World War had come to an end, Europe was in, a, was in a state of turmoil, as you can imagine. But out of this state of turmoil grew this education system, which today has spread around the world. People ask me, what relevance does a school have if it is from Europe a hundred years ago? And I would like to reply that it is very important, this education system, because at the center of this education system is the universal child, child anywhere in the world. And that is the reason you can have a world of school in any part of the world and modify the curriculum to suit the environment and the nature of that country, as well as the past, the history, and the geography. So world of education really fits into any part of the world and also for children from all walks of life. Now I'd like to begin by reciting what Rudolf Steiner had written a hundred years ago. And he said, our highest endeavor must be to develop free human beings who are able of themselves to impart purpose and direction to their lives. The need for imagination, a sense of truth, and the feeling of responsibility, these three forces 
are the very nerve of education. Rudolf Steiner, 1861 to 1925. Now, the meaning of art in education, as we have already heard from our very special speakers this morning, is that you cannot have education without art. Indeed, in world of education, art is not separate from education, but it is totally integrated into all the subjects of the school curriculum. So whether you are teaching language, or maths, or science, or any other subject which belongs to the curriculum, art is an integral part of this very education. And the main reason is that we are educating children on a threefold level. First of all, of course, we are educating the children according to the thinking. The academic subjects are very important, as we all know. Different subjects which have to do with the academics. And in addition to that, we have the subjects which we call the subjects of the heart. The word art is part of the word heart. And we have noticed that art ennobles the human being. So that when we work with art in school, at the same time, we are imparting certain values to our children, which really ennoble them for life. And third, but equally important, is the work that we do with the children on the level of the limbs. In our country, unfortunately, we do not appreciate the work that is being done in the area of cleaning and arranging and so on. But one day the bai doesn't come to the house and we are all very upset because it is impossible to go on through the day without having a clean house. And we teach the children the value of working with their limbs as being equally important. So here in the school curriculum, we have the subjects of the head, the academic subjects, the subjects of the heart, which are the artistic subjects, and the subjects of the limb, which have to do with using the limbs in a proper way, not just with cleaning and so on, but also making things with one's own hands. And you will be interested to know that in the Steiner education curriculum, we have also subjects in addition to the artistic subjects like painting, drawing, and also singing, music, dancing, we have also the subjects of the limbs, which we call the hand or the manual subjects. And there we have subjects like woodwork and metalwork, basket weaving, and so on. And also working with spinning and weaving, which are in fact an integral part of our Indian culture, but which we do not use enough. So here we have the threefold ap approach to education, the threefold human being of the head, heart, and limbs. And it has been seen that when we educate the children on a threefold level, that we actually impart values to last the whole life. For example, we say that the whole education system is divided into rhythms of seven years. So the first seven years, or you would say the first six years, the children get the education in the kindergarten. And art is very much an integral part of the kindergarten. The children are given the three primary colors and they are made to work with the three primary colors to make the three secondary colors. So with three colors, you have the whole palette of the rainbow. And the children of themselves, they really can use these three colors to create all the colors of the rainbow. And this is something very enriching. They are given certain guidance, but at the end of the day, they make their own pictures. And it's amazing what children can come up with. Then we have 
when the children come into class one, when they are six or seven years old, that's when for the first time they learn how to write and read and count. And you might think it's very late in the life of the child, but in fact, what they have learned in kindergarten, this has been a preparatory stage for what is to come in the great schools. And the children are taught how to write and read and count also in an artistic manner. So when you teach the children how to write, you actually create a story which leads to the letter of the alphabet and from the drawing, the letter of the alphabet is created. So it's story, drawing, and the letter of the alphabet. And similarly, when we teach the children counting, we introduce the numbers, not just in a quantitative way, but in a qualitative way. So how different is number one from number two in its quality, or number three? And this way, the artistic understanding is already embedded in the manner in which we teach writing, reading, and counting. Now, we have noticed that in the first seven years of the child, child's life, the children are introduced to kindergarten education, which creates in them the value of goodness. Just by teaching, and not by preaching, the children really learn the value of goodness in the way they interact with one another, in the way they see the world around them, in the way they perceive also the society at that young age. Then in the seven, second seven years of the child's life, they are introduced to what we would say the arts, the subject of the heart, and that is also, of course, what we call beauty. Beauty as being very intrinsic to the human being, and not just the outward beauty. And then finally, in the third seven years of the child's development, we also have the concept yes. of truth. So these are the three different manners in which the children's understanding of the world around them unfold. Now, there are a lot of things that can be said about world of education, but here I would like to end because we still have our working with the panel discussion, and that is the reason I would like to just end by saying that we begin the day with the morning circle, which brings all the children and the teacher together, and we do a lot of singing, songs for different religious festivals, songs for different occasions, and last but not the least, songs for the seasons. And we make the children aware of their environment through music, singing and dancing, and of course, through drawing and painting. So here I would like to end. I have given you certain sheets. You may have received these. If you have not, you can always come to me and ask for them. On one side is a poem called The World of Impulse, which I've written for the centenary of World of Education. And on the other side, there is an announcement of a seminar which we hold every year in the month of May during the summer holidays. And we introduce World of Education in Khandala for two weeks. The first week is for the beginners and the second week is for the people who are already acquainted with that. And there you will get a deeper understanding of what art education in Waldorf schools is all about. Thank you very much. A very good afternoon, everyone. Um, my presentation is from a workshop and this workshop was part of the Students' Binale. That was the second edition of the Students' Binale, 2016 and 17. So what I bring, bring with this, I mean, I'm going to present with what exactly happened. A very, it's going to be a glimpse because I just have seven minutes to go through this. So, yeah, so thank you for that. 
so uh, the workshop was part of a student's finale, and uh, I had chosen to work with three institutions. There were 15 fellows while I was one of the fellow uh, at the second edition of Students Binale. Uh, so um, the, I, I actually went on to think of uh, doing this workshop with the Sir J.J. School of Arts in Bombay, uh, students from the Sir J.J. School of Art Bombay. And the workshop was titled Practice in Transitional Space. So it was more about uh, my experiences of intervening into the institution and also the challenges that I was thrown at when I entered the institute. Also, one thing that I would want to mention is I am a, a graduate student, done my BFA from Surgery School of Arts. So going back to the institute again and looking at what exactly is happening so there were a couple of things that I came across when I also thought of intervening with the uh, workshop plans into the institute. Uh, first thing was I met Amrita, uh, and I had been I had been going through a couple of uh, workshops which they had been doing. So I was reading, got to know from a couple of students in the institute that they had been attending workshop, especially the geographies of consumption that was just was done in 2015, I guess. So. With all of that, I thought, okay, let me intervene into the students and ask to, to also let them just talk to me because that was re really a challenge for me. So beginning with the workshop was uh, like to get them to speak. So doing that was again a challenge for me because then we just got into sitting together, discussing on a couple of things, discussing about the practice. But, you know, they were not able to really come up or, or talk about it much. So it was a good amount of group of students that we started discussing on. So when I planned this workshop, the focus of the workshop was to get the students out of the Art Institute and make them really intervene into their own neighborhood, their very local spaces, their own locality. So doing that, I had placed some constraints over to begin with. So just giving a layout to the students, like to to do this, what and where we can tap into. So the closest area that I thought was the Crawford Market. So this became the starting point to really beginning. And this, and this workshop I haven't mentioned. It, this was like a three months long. So I really thought like doing a, a longer one could really give them a time, the students a time, and also for me to uh, understand the whole process. So the focus was... Uh, the local market. So then Crawford was something that was really closest. It has a long history, first thing. And the second thing, there is a lot of connect that uh, the institute has location-wise in terms of and otherwise also where students um, are so much connected with the space, uh, buying materials, the stationery, and so many other things. So uh, how did how would they intervene? That was again one of the uh, because when I'm laying with on them so many constraints and challenges, like you have to have a, a final outcome. So they have to have a work. Work could be in any medium, but uh, this was something which they then again ke kept thinking and then to intervene, how to begin intervening. So I facilitated a little bit on this uh, when they chose to work. And how would they cho choose to work with what person or who would be their co-worker or, you know, who would they co-work with or the subordinate? So this was something that the students chose and they came up with. So there were total seven students. Uh, so they, uh, each of them, uh, ha each of them uh, kind of uh, intervened into spaces, like something like a cobbler space their working space, the looking at the tools, looking at the way they work, the techniques, learning the techniques, learning the work. It was also meant uh, to really learn and share the skills, be it uh, on part of the students coming from the Art Institute and going out uh, to collaborate with someone who is not at all uh, connected with the art act as such, but is somewhere involved into production of some sort or uh, repair work, a vendor. That was like a very a vast thing which they were let open to students. So they uh, then there was the one student who went to Kayani, 
uh, also their references or their uh, ideas or interests was something which uh, came from uh, their interest at some point it was also like uh, they uh, they had been seeing these people work around like the student who chose to see to the cobbler space he had been you know uh, passing that space where he keeps seeing this person do work and all of that. So I think these were the things that came up as the starting point to really begin with. And then there was a student who uh, went into seeing a metal worker, so learn the skills, how do they, you know, do this uh, metal cutting and things like that. And uh, they came up with a quite interesting works. Also intervening the spaces, uh, the basic idea was to also f uh, fi find a way to research or find their, build their own methodologies to enter, intervene such spaces because this is something that was really new for them to do first time I think that they were doing. So uh, while they were intervening, a uh, few things that we discussed, depending on each student, because each student was handling a different uh, person, and he, he or she was uh, in conversation or in dialogue with a person who has his own business or her own business to do with. So looking at how the times should be, uh, how the times should be fixed, or uh, what ways to intervene. So few were like to just interview the person, uh, to just begin with interviewing the person, uh, otherwise just go sit, observe. So there was something where most of them uh, had a lot of answers for themselves while just observing what the, the person is doing. And then incorporate or bring that into work was again one of the challenges which they themselves, I think, uh, found their own methodologies to really intervene and uh, find their own tools while they were, while they do have something, uh, a strong curriculum that, I mean, the college has, you know, the a long history of colonial education and all of that. So I think this turned out to be a break, sort of a thing, a gap, oscillating between their own so-called stubborn classrooms and then going out, meeting these people and then learning from them. So this was one, and then I just want to share now the three uh, spaces. The Kiani one, there's a student called Ayushi. Uh, she used to like every day go to the person and then you know the owner and then also at the end what came out was very interesting. How they kind of built a relationship with their uh, collaborators, the persons they worked with. Uh, that was something uh, really interesting for me. Uh, there's something called human relations, which we kind of s sort of lose at times. And uh, being in, within the art institute, uh, they kind of get uh, very much focused on doing, doing art, but not stepping out of the institute. So I think this was one of the ways um, I found that uh, for me also, and for also students looking at their uh, inputs later and the feedbacks, uh, so this is a uh, work by Aman, and this is the um, cobbler's shop that he, so uh, most of them, what they did was they also began with photo documenting the space. I think this became the very research basis for them to really think of what are they gonna work and what are they gonna come up with. Also, understanding material, learning from them was also understanding material for themselves, uh, how to incorporate in their work, uh, this is a work by Sanika. Uh, she constantly had been visiting this metal fabricator shop in Thane. So the, the space did not uh, left limited to the Crawford market, but then as in when they started to really get around their own spaces where they are placed, residing, so they chose their own uh, collaborators or whom they are to collaborate then. And this was uh, concluded with one uh, mentor session by Amrita with the students, which was again something which they brought in front of her so much of uh, material that they had uh, uh, collected from this whole thing. And they had also started working. So they had some work in process uh, images with them or works with them directly, sketchbooks that they carried. And then the mentor session was something really important uh, because uh, 
after the mentor session, they also understood, uh, they could theorize things later. It was like uh, uh, f finding ways to intervene and then not going with a pre uh, or pretext. Like, uh, you know, most often what happens is at the institute is they're given a subject and then they intervene around that. But here they really form theories accordingly. Uh, for example, like migration is something like a big word these days, and then you throw at them, they just get boggled. But it came so easy to them, okay, like this cobbler who's been shifted to this place, he's been staying there for 15 years. So what, what goes into all of the whole logistics of settling at one place, and then, you know, all the, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I could only get three images from the, because... I was like, I shouldn't bombard them <laughs> a lot. Uh, so yeah, so the the rest were uh, these three, and apart from that, the, there was one uh, which uh, Ashwam did with. Uh, he did not work with the the chai stall or a tea stall fellow, but he was intrigued by this noise that constantly of the grinding. Usually, that chai walas they grind a ginger or something like some masalas. So he was like, uh, this, for him it was like, it came through the medium first, so sound was something that he was intrigued with, and then he created a small audio piece from that, which was so uh, confusing otherwise, it was at times also something like the trains, local trains that keep making the noise, and then there was a lot of resemblance to that when it, it went to Kochi. So all these works later went to Kochi, so after the mentor session they really reworked in terms of techniques, that was like a big thing for them because the one who, uh, the student, the student who did the uh, work, she actually created a sculpture with the all-purpose flower at the Kayani itself. So they had let her use the oven, and so she she kind of used the the people who are working there to really learn the techniques to make this big six feet sculpture. So yeah, yeah, I think I have conclude. Thank you. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone here. Uh, first, I would like to thank Avid Learning and Art First to kind of create uh, an opportunity to share uh, the work that we're doing at the Gateway School of Mumbai. Uh, I found two challenges in this process. First, to talk about a pedagogical model and uh, kind of emphasizing on reimagining it and presenting it to people in seven minutes was quite challenging. Uh, and then putting it out through a presentation is again quite going to be challenging, so I'm going to be making it more precise. Uh, of course, I'm ready to have like questions later what model they are following today. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the school first, and then I'm going to connect the arts program back to the philosophy of the school. Uh, we are an eight-year-old school, and uh, the focus of the school is uh, making 21st century learners and uh, uh, giving children, uh, we are a school for children with learning disabilities and uh, having uh, a population of 84 children in the school. We know we come from a space of privilege to kind of experiment and that's why we also call ourselves a lab school where we kind of build in a lot of, uh, derive a lot of best practices around the world and uh, pedagogical practices, classroom practices and then try to see how it works into in terms of our population and uh, when we started the school, uh, I would say I'm the second generation of uh, art educators at Gateway. The reason I say that is because uh, when we opened the school, a lot of our children that we uh, uh, took in had a lot of uh, social and uh, emotional needs. And that is the reason the first three years of the arts program, uh, the emphasis was on uh, art therapy. So that's why we had a therapy-oriented program. Uh, it's the last four years where uh, I'm going to share uh, more than a model, I'm going to share how the program has evolved in terms of the practices that we do at school and how it has transitioned from a therapy-oriented program to an educational-oriented program now. And I would start with uh, mentioning the need to do so. Uh, when we were doing a therapy-oriented program, we did realize that while the arts program is there, 
it should also support the uh, philosophy and the vision of the school of giving children these tools because we are making them uh, we are preparing them to transition in the outside world you know we do have children with learning disabilities we have we do have children with learning challenges but what the school is focusing on is eventually transitioning these children out into the world and that's why the arts program can support this vision and the program needs the model the pedagogical model needs to be in a way that is supporting directly directly supporting this vision uh, so uh, the is my voice audible now so the visual arts program at gateway uh, focuses on five different areas uh, the main objective is uh, giving students making them artistic literate individuals now when i say artistic literate individuals what do i mean i mean they use art as a mode of communication they use art as a creative personal realization they use art as a means to understand culture understand history uh, they also use arts as a means to their emotional well-being and also use arts uh, as a means for community engagement now all these are not exclusive uh, this all these five areas are identified in a way how a child could use this very effectively for their learning uh, i also emphasize a little bit about the because we are talking about learning models and environment what is the gateway school uh, uh, what infrastructure does the gateway school have in terms of the forms of art that we teach i would like to start with the talking about the physical and envi learning environment that we talk in a school setting a lot of times uh, when we talk about art we confine it to the art studio or the art room where we can have the setup to teach something uh, or we have the infrastructure inside the room to teach something what we do at gateway is uh, we take the art outside the classroom which means you can very effectively use the area or the space around your school not just inside the school but also geographically the location where your school is based you know if you're doing collaborations if you're teaching children a certain kind of uh, activity how you can inculcate the, the the geography of the school or the areas around into your teaching i would give an example uh, i was teaching a lesson about uh, uh, sketching from the nature you know a lot of uh, we can derive there are a lot of elements from the nature so instead of sending children out to collect the material so like i had to teach uh, nature sketching and collect all the material and get into the classroom why not take the children out over there and we have those spaces around the school which actually facilitates this kind of uh, learning uh, i have mentioned what what benefits does it have to take the classroom outside the studio uh, of course it's it it reinvigorates the imagination the learning practices and children often develop a sense of observation which can't be done in a classroom they they directly first hand engage with the material that they are working with the kind of resources or the sources that they are finding for an inspiration or a reference for their artwork uh the second essential learning model from gateway that i would like to highlight is the learning that happens outside the school outside the classroom so we have been emphasizing a lot on uh, uh bringing in learning by field trips you know industrial visits so uh in the first picture you see our children went to see an exhibition of uh, tota vaikuntham the painter and uh, it was in context to a form that we were learning an indian a tribal form of art that we were learning in the classroom so this uh, exhi visit to the exhibition not only served for children to just have a direct reference but also engaging with the artist himself you know having a dialogue with him learning about his process learning about uh, his methodology that he incorporates into his work uh, i i very purposely intentionally actually put the picture the second picture over there where our students the middle schoolers went to watch a uh, exhibition by el uh, abraham alkazi that happened at the ngma a few years back and uh, i i i really want to emphasize because the ch the purpose of this visit was to get some uh, connections into the into a math and art project that i'm going to come back to uh, we were doing a math and art collaboration where the children were learning about area in math and uh, they were building 3d models they were redesigning a classroom in school and they were bringing in the art aspect of redesigning the classroom through a 3d model now it it was it was immensely contextual because at the exhibition we had uh, miniature sets of alkazi's uh, theater plays 
and the children got a direct context of seeing what a theater set looks like and having those connections back into the classroom. And that's why such trips of taking our children out to watch exhibitions, to watch the uh, work of uh, renowned artists is very important. Uh, I mentioned another example of, uh, you know, uh, we did a, we do an art show every year where we showcase our students' work. And uh, one of the years we were teaching our adaptive program, the high school uh, adaptive students who are uh, working, uh, learning life skills, uh, the skill of candle making. And we kind of backward mapped that uh, whole exercise of right from taking them to a factory which, uh, you know, manufactures uh, fragrances to calling in experts in the school to give children a first-hand experience of how those chemical reactions happen connecting something from humanities and science and bringing in, then bringing in the art aspect of actually making the candles. Such kind of learning, we believe, actually facilitates uh, uh, a first-hand connection. Also, students get to understand the process right from the beginning instead of you know, starting it from midway or understanding the art aspect of it. Uh, we really f uh, focus on project-based learning at the school, which means uh, we believe that the visual art or the other two disciplines like the drama or music cannot happen in isolation. It's really important. Uh, I, I, I really connected what Aban Ma'am said about uh, taking the arts, integrating it into the curriculum, you know, integrating the arts with the other subjects in the school. I put one example over here, the same example where the students were uh, learning about the area, uh, doing a unit on, in maths on the area of a uh, unit of uh, unit of area and that's where we connected uh, the art module of it uh, at gateway we really uh, emphasize on external collaborations so, you know so we we go with the philosophy that a art teacher cannot bring in everything into the classroom you need children to interact with experts you need children to interact you need to create a space for children to actually work with artists work with uh, thinkers outside and engage with them uh, so we collab we collaborate with external professionals on an ongoing rotational basis around the year which means we either get them to school or we take our children out into their workshops or their workspaces to actually understand their philosophy of work. How do they work? What kind of infrastructure do they have? How do they design? How does design thinking work in their sector? Uh, how do they get inspiration for uh, their work that they produce? So I put in examples of the first example is of uh, uh, a fashion designer, Sandeep Gonsalves of the SS Home, uh, taking in our students' illustrations. And this was a module that the high schoolers were learning about. Uh, uh, fashion designing so actually bringing in the expert to explain a child in a classroom what they could do with their illustrations how those illustrations are digitally transformed into designs those are eventually go on to a uh, outfit uh, another example is we had Ramesh Gurjula the painter coming in and working with the high schoolers uh, we do believe that the arts is for all it's 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 not meant for a particular group of ch uh, children it, it's supposed to be for everyone. So what, in, in, a, in a pedagogical model, what we really do is backward map what a child will eventually learn, uh, which means that uh, we really identify first is the strength the student brings in into their learning. Uh, what, we focus on what they can, we build on what they can do rather than what they cannot do and then working on that. So which means Every child is different. We accept the fact that every child is different and the curriculum has to facilitate learning for every child into the classroom. The last two things I would like to uh, close my presentation with, we're really working, this is work in progress right now. We are trying to involve the arts more structurally into the child IEP, which is the individualized education program, identifying what eventually the child would want to do once they transition out of school, and how can the arts program support that goal, working with the parents. And uh, uh, we also started integrating a lot of digital mediums, adaptive technology into the classroom, which supports the child into their learning. So if a child is really uh, great at learning through tech, but is kind of struggling with you know into the classroom how can tech support the child into their learning and the outcome that the child has that's all thank you thank you for those wonderful presentations um, in fact I was just telling Ritu there's so much interesting 
food for thought out here that uh, we want to see more presentations and less and more looking forward to the workshop later but i'm going to start with uh, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts which just came up when you all were presenting i'll start with aban and you know you had mentioned um, how the waldorf uh, system uh, can be modified with the changing environment and it's obviously been around for almost 100 years but given that we now live in the age of technology and the the need for creative thinking is different how how do you all go about modifying the curriculum thank you thank you asad this is a very frequently asked question of course because uh, 100 years ago we didn't have the kind of technology which we have now and obviously we have to make sure that the children get what they need for the future and uh, what we do is we do not give technology very early in life so by the time the children enter let's say middle school they are introduced gradually to technology and it's amazing how quickly they learn and it is quite often thought that the earlier we do things the better it is for the children but in fact the opposite is true because you know people ask me why do you introduce writing and reading only when the children are 6 or 7 but once they are introduced to writing and reading and counting they are very good at it so it doesn't have to begin when they are 2 or 3 years old and another thing is also with technology you don't have to start when they are very small because it is not suitable for very young children to be introduced to technology so we wait until the children are in middle school before we introduce that and then because they have been waiting for so long they are very happy to be introduced to technology and they are very good at it so when you see the exam results of class 10 and 12 the board exams they do as well in technology subjects as children who have had it much earlier but you know i think it's in the at least in the last 5 years and you know uh, again being a parent of a young kid and somebody told me this once that you know they're born into technology you can't deny it and you know kids know how to do this before they know how to turn a page and anywhere in the world you go you see you know and everyone lives in this 24/7 kind of a life where the easiest thing for a parent to do is give a gives more to the child i mean everyone is guilty of that and you try to uh, you know so kids have technology they they do know they do know the power of it my daughter said papa google it hmm. when she doesn't know something and but so what how does your curriculum change then you see you have to give alternatives there is technology but there is life beyond technology and if the children are given art and they are happy drawing pictures and painting at home and doing things with their hands it is true that they really go into that world very happily and very easily and yet have technology one cannot deny but one always has to give an alternative to what we think is not appropriate and so we have noticed that with children and we also have classes for parents so that they can orient themselves too and we have noticed that there are parents who come to us and say oh it's really working very well the children are enjoying reading simple story books or drawing and painting and doing things with their hands and they are not getting so obsessed with gadgets and gizmos so there you have to offer an alternative you cannot just say no but you have to say that there is something else that can be offered to them I'm going to just move to Abhishek and you mentioned um, you you called yourself a lab school. Um and we'll just stick on the technology topic right now because that kind of interests me personally but um, you know you mentioned how you all use technology and and uh, digitization to kind of further the education could you just share some more thoughts on that? So I think uh, how I also see the visual arts is I I see it as like an umbrella and under that you have photography under that you have uh, a lot of things uh, areas that you can work in and produce work into but i think there are x number of ways on how you can reach the reach the process uh, i'll give you an example uh, of uh, because i spoke about empowering children and you know giving them that medium to express uh, which arts itself has a purpose of uh, i have a child who's on the spectrum and uh, who is brilliant with his illustrations on paper now i introduced a program into my uh, curriculum 
where it's in, it aligns with his IP, where eventually we see him becoming an illustrator. Now, it's my role into my pedagogy to in, uh, you know, support it with tech. How am I supporting? There are brilliant uh, apps out there on simple uh, equipments that a child uses, you know, a phone, uh, an iPad, and the child is now learning to use the simple softwares that are designed for children into, this, uh, into a school setting to turn his uh, hand-drawn illustrations into digital illustrations. And we have an expert from outside who comes in and talks about the grammar, talks about the techniques of doing this, and the child is now not only doing illustrations but learning animation. And uh, eventually we see this child doing stories, which is coming from the language class where he's understanding the different uh, styles of storytelling, understanding the different elements of storytelling. Combining these two, his work is very thought of. There is, is something that tech is supporting him to achieve his goals. So I think that's what how we're leveraging it. I'm going to come back to you with uh, more questions about some programs that you've started there. Uh, but um, um, Shruti, I'm just, I'm just going to look. Um, so, you know, the, the, has the, the, the Biennale, the, 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 the uh, ripple effect of the Biennale to a global Biennale concept kind of aided in these alternate learning opportunities and how is it kind of has it created a further um, growth model for many of your students or uh, participants think, yes uh, uh, in terms of the way they started especially with this workshop i mean also i'm talking about workshop because there had been other fellows with me who had who have done the workshop have taken the workshop as a module so i think uh, such alternative also uh, to explore the spaces within the city. So city has been a frequent thing that we, all of us had been doing. So uh, I think that's what had been, um, and also post the whole thing, like after the display and things like that, uh, there has been a lot of discussion among students. I think they coming together and discussing things. Uh, at the same time, uh, the way you're saying like uh, how it has, but I think it has in a very little manner, but it has like... Uh, uh, you, you mentioned it's a, it's a break from the colonial education. Uh, this is a new form of complete... Uh, is it... How, how different is it from... A break as in a break for them to step out of institute. Mm -hmm. I mean, I meant only to there. Right. Because I don't think it is yet a break in terms of really coming out of... I think it's, it would also be depending on uh, if the curriculums that are so much... Uh, not yet changed kind of things could be worked upon or such alternate ways of uh, intervening could come in many other ways like there has been like so many artists had been coming to the institute and then doing you know you you mentioned the mentorship sessions right yeah. um, and so how important are these in in these creating alternate formats of learning or uh, I think very important especially with the one that uh, happened with Amrita uh, it was altogether, um, yeah, I think if she wants to uh, add. And to. Thank you, Shruti and Asad. Um, so I think when uh, Shruti came to meet me um, uh, regarding mentoring uh, this workshop at the school, it also uh, drew uh, to my own uh, experience of wanting to take children out of, I mean, the kids out of school, uh, out of class for an art history class in the garden, sitting within arts, within the art school. And that was like, looked at, Are, kya kar rahi hai? you know, that kind of a thing. So, uh, so I like that model where you were being a student there, you were also challenging the curriculum there in this kind of alternative formats. And uh, many of the students who were part of uh, your workshop were also part of the geographies of consumption, Bombay, Mumbai, um, project, uh, public art project, with uh, where I curated it for the Mole Park Center, and I collaborated with Nikhil Purohit as well. So, um, uh, so that in that thing, we had a lot of uh, same people who had come there, and I exactly remember the kind of difficulties we had in breaking that that barrier. Like both Nikhil and I, we we kind of designed ten sessions uh, for across uh, two months. And uh, then, actually, the first question was, why public? That was the first question they had. Why public? Why go You know, what would that? So when you draw that line, what are, the, what are the tools that you need to engage to 
come over that line. And I think that is where, uh, you know, that experience also was brought into the mentor mentoring um, workshop that we had. And uh, that's how when you said migration, I mean, the, we both talked about it, the cobbler who's sitting outside the, the school, he's there every day, but who looks at him and what is his story? So if, the, uh, if there are students who are painting cobblers in the classroom in a realistic fashion, which comes from, down from colonial art education, what do you do going out and speaking to the cobbler himself? What does, what does that story mean? So I think these are the things that sort of broke down the barriers that we're talk talking about. And that's one, just one example, but. Thank you. Um, Abhishek, you know, you told us about the visual arts program at Gateway, uh, Gateway School and the importance of physical learning environments as well as project-based learning. Can you tell us more about these, your past associations of alternate education platforms like the Yellow Pinwheel Kids Project and the Bombay Pencil Jammers? It sounded quite interesting. Uh, the Bombay Pencil Jammers is a little personally driven project. So when I started, I, I, I myself, I'm an artist educator. So uh, in 2000, uh, I think 13, around 2013, 14, uh, I found a, I, I had a drive and I wanted to connect with like-minded people in the city. And I was looking for uh, platforms of where I could do this. You know, how, how, do, how do I uh, engage with people who, uh, who bring in a similar vision, who want to be in the education space, uh, open those kind of dialogues uh, in a public space. Uh, that's where I started Bombay Pencil Jammers. Uh, it was a community of educators and artists, uh, and we met every Sunday in a public space. And uh, the original idea was to start sketching, open up, uh, you know, critically uh, comment on each other's work, understand where do we come from, what, what areas are we working in. It eventually, I think after a year, reached a point where we, our goal shifted to reclaiming public spaces, you know, like going... <laughs> Going into uh, going into a public parks uh, in Bombay, and you know, having people getting people curious to what exactly are we doing? Why are we working into a space, uh, uh, public space? Why are we sketching? You know, why are we sitting in front of uh, Gateway of India and sketching the Gateway of India? Uh, but I think this was more of a, a, a passion project I would call that I was doing, and uh, to connect with people. And we didn't stop there. We actually moved ahead. Uh, where uh, uh, I think there was an episode of uh, a, a, I think the government stopping. Uh, some artists sketching at the Elephanta Caves. And that's where we kind of uh, dug deeper into it to find out that there is a policy which uh, stops you from uh, you know, uh, sketching or after the, the terrorist attacks in Bombay. And uh, there's a uh, government policy which stops you from sketching or recording public spaces. And uh, we definitely had to push in and say that we're not terrorists, we're not planning anything. Uh, but actually that, uh, we started a petition, an online petition, for the government to take this down. And you know, we, we connected with similar uh, pencil jamming uh, groups across India in different cities uh, that were happening. And uh, we filed a petition, we filed, uh, signed an online petition that we started, and we were quite successful in actually, you know, also going ahead and filing an RTI back then and finding out what exactly is this uh, uh, structure in the government or the law is and how we can tackle that. Uh, but I think uh, eventually the art practice is that also. I believe as an educator, the ideologies or the philosophies that bring into your class, you bring into your classroom, I think you, it comes from your personal practice. It comes from your personal vision of what you actually want to do into the space. And the pinwheel? Uh, the Yellow Kin Pinwheel Kids project was uh, more of a book that I illustrated. Now, this is a coloring activity uh, book for uh, children ages uh, 8 to 16. And this was more of a cultural project where through a coloring book, we were trying to educate children about the different aspects of Bombay. So the book had different coloring sheets where uh, I illustrated the different aspects of Bombay in uh, four different uh, coloring sheets. One was the people of Bombay, one was the transport of Bombay, the third one was the monuments of uh, historical uh, importance and other structures, and the fourth one was more of a, 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 a I would say, getting children curious about what do they see around them, giving them like a starter to uh, start conversations in classroom, help teachers in classrooms to use this coloring kit uh, as a pedagogical tool to start conversations in classroom uh, with regards to culture and the history of Bombay. Um, I'll just quickly go to Aban. Um, you know, you mentioned um, um, art as part of heart. And um, how does the Waldorf School integrate uh, the philosophy and the arts to give us unique learning experience? 
as I mentioned, we start very early in the school. When the children are three years old and they come to the kindergarten for the first time, we already give them the opportunity to work with colors and to have different songs to sing and so on. So the whole palette of arts, of performing arts and also of visual arts is given to them at their level, of course, their level of age. And so in a very natural way, they become acquainted with colors, with drawing, painting and such things. And then when they come to grade school, as we call it, then, as I said, the art is integrated in such a way that Every subject that we introduce to the children has an element of art in it too. And it is up to the teacher to t introduce it in the way she or he finds it appropriate. And we have noticed that when the teachers have had a fair amount of understanding for this subject and have a background, they can really approach the children in a wonderful manner. And the teacher does not necessarily have to be an art student in her youth. She can just, or he can just be somebody who has an aptitude for art, and sometimes not even that. And we have noticed that many teachers who are not particularly uh, good at art, or what we can say, they don't uh, have a negative impact on the children. On the contrary, the children do better because uh, they are trying to make up for what they have not learned. And that is the reason any teacher can actually bring art to the children without actually being an art teacher. You see what I mean? Yep. Just an ordinary class teacher or a kindergarten teacher can also bring art to the children insofar as she or he is convinced that this is the right approach. You know, Penny had mentioned school without walls. So, this is to the whole panel. Uh, I mean, what do you think the future of a classroom is going to look like? moving forwards. You want to start, Shruti? Is it going to be outside the colonial models? Oh, yeah, totally. I think that would be really interesting to just step out of. <laughs> uh, but I think not to say no, no to the models. Uh, I think there is something which one can take from the model. But what I mean is not to just remove the whole thing. But this idea of coming out of the class is really interesting, especially in the case that I feel like is most of the government institutions in India, art institutions in India, they need to somewhere find this ways of mm. stepping out. I think that's really something interesting that she mentioned, like without. Also, how one unlearns uh, the mm. moment you step out. I think that's something, it comes that easy. So. Avishak, you mentioned uh, the field trips yeah. a lot in your presentation. I would like to answer the previous question first. All right. Uh, wow. I have a very interesting take on that as an educator because I've been uh, reading a very, I've been uh, reading a American educator, Olivia Good, and her principles of uh, postmodernism art. Uh, I've answered that que I look at it, the answer to that question in two different aspects. One is the pedagogy that happens in school and the classroom and how we change that in terms of the future and how we take our learning outside the class. So, uh, Good mentions a very interesting concept of how our education, the, uh, the art education or the art classroom is still based on the seven principles or the seven principles of art or the seven principles of designing in classroom. And she's derived uh, new principles of, uh, she's proposed rather, new principles in art making, which talks about layering or juxtaposition. Or she talks about, uh, uh, you know, appropriating art. And we are going to, in the future, make these proposed principles a part of our art teaching, I feel. And not in isolation, but also using the uh, previous seven principles of art. And that's going to be very important in affecting, uh, that's going to affect our pedagogy in the future. About taking art, I think it's high time we take our art classrooms outside. And that's the reason I emphasize so much on collaborations, because as I said, I, I, I'm, I firmly believe, and that's, that's like a very subjective that, you know, our teacher cannot bring in everything. You know, as a teacher, you have to, need to have that awareness that, you know, I, I could be an artist. I could, I could bring in a vision. I could bring in a philosophy of how art's supposed to be learned or taken by a child. I can integrate that with teaching practices that my organization has or follows. But there needs to be collaboration. There needs to be the art classroom needs to go out, work with experts, get them on board, expose our children. So, yeah, I think that's, that's the future where I see the arts education. May I answer 
Sure. Yes, I believe there is something called art without walls. I mean, classrooms without walls. But uh, it, will, it has to be structured. We believe in having structured curriculum so that things are done in a proper manner. And when the necessity arises, obviously, then we do go beyond the classroom walls. And for example, when we introduce subjects like geology or astronomy, which comes in the upper school, then the children are made to go out for two or three weeks and really uh, observe what is around them and also nat nature observation. So from that point of view, we bring the children out of the classrooms, but then they come back to bring the whole thing in a balance. Wonderful. I'm just going to end with one last question for the whole panel. Um, could you discuss the importance of creative thinking, which was my original strain of thought, and therefore the importance of arts education with respect to future of work? Because you are... Can I have a question to repeat the question? Okay. It's discuss the importance of creative thinking and therefore art education with respect to the future of work. Because we don't know what jobs are going to look like in 10 years. It mm -hmm. keeps evolving. And, you know, so we're trying to train and prepare students for a life that we don't know what's actually going to be. Because things are changing so fast right now. I think I, I connected back to a term called design thinking which is uh, very important uh, and we, we, most of the educators, not a general statement, but it's a very gray area we don't want to dwell into because it requires a lot of uh, teacher, uh, the teacher to evolve with their thinking. You know, you have your traditional methods of teaching, you have your traditional practices that you can bring into the classroom, but design thinking is something that once you start involving that into the classroom, you are no longer a teacher, you become a facilitator and your teach students are driving the classroom. And that's where uh, I think uh, you also start investigating about why, what a child is learning and how that is impacting the future. You know, if I am teaching, I could conventionally teach uh, uh, making a model, which I showed in my uh, uh, presentation with a math model. But what skill sets am I building into a student or a child that's going to help them make informed decisions when they decide what path they want to go to later? You know, just by doing an art and math project, I'm not inculcating values or core skills, you know, to become an engineer or a scientist. But there's a lot of uh, art making, you know, you, you could become an artist, you could become a space designer, you could become an interior designer. The second aspect I think about Asad's question is uh, what kind of uh, future jobs do we see? You know, even in today's conventional job setups, there's a lot of, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I would, how do I put it in words? I think a lot of improvisation happening. You know, you have graphic designing as an industry, for example, but the application is changing. In what ways you apply your skill set and your knowledge into uh, the industry is changing. Uh, you have... Uh, I mean, uh, the, the industries are evolving, I feel. And uh, that's what the purpose of edu art education or any kind of education should be to not prepare children to uh, tackle questions, but give them those tools to, to creatively think to address those uh, problems in the future, I feel. Shruti, you had mentioned uh, unlearning. Is that important for the revolutionizing of the learning moving forward? I think, yeah, it's really important because uh, also one more thing, uh, it's... I think, with, especially in terms of art institutions, there's a lot of burden to become artist. Um, I mean, once you step out, I mean, this has been for years, and, and still it's, it's so evident in the colleges yet. I think it's very important to give them, as he said, the tools in different manners in art institutions today to really have in front of them a platter of so many things, and then they choose from it, and not really be focused at one you know that linear thing of just becoming that one thing and then and then sometimes it collapses with most of the students it happens so i think unlearning would play a role there interesting uh, while they have the tools in front of them interesting you know I, I, one example i use all the time is you know i obviously come from an advertising background and many people who are in advertising don't really stick around they always land up doing something very interesting and i say you know when you're there you're exposed to creativity you think differently there are different ways of working which kind of teaches you to be more open and, and evolve yourself with changing times. And I think, you know, whether you're a trained artist or not, uh, I think more if you're a creative thinker, the world of opportunity is open to you. With that, I'm going to end and we'll go for lunch. And hopefully I'll have lots of questions, which we can then take uh, at the workshop. Thank you very much, wonderful panel. Thank you.